Hi, I'm Vincent from the YouTube channel Stardust and uh, today it's a bit special because it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission and at this occasion we had the pleasure to interview Jerry Griffin, former flight director during the Apollo 13 disaster. Uh, which was not so much a disaster. Anyway, so during this interview, we're going to talk about the incident of Apollo 13 and what we can learn from it uh, in these difficult times uh, with the coronavirus. So yeah, I hope you will like it. It was made here in Lyon, France during the lockdown and Jerry was in Houston, Texas during this interview. So we can have some video problems and audio problems. I hope uh, you will like it anyways and if you like it please leave a like and don't hesitate to leave a comment and share it's very important anyways have a good interview just before you went to nasa you were a uh, engineer at the u.s air force for the u.s air force actually i was i was flying in the air force and um and when al shepherd uh flew i decided I really wanted to get into the space business. So I actually, I got out of the uh, Air Force after I fulfilled my commitment and went to work uh, in the satellite test center for the Air Force as an engineer um, for Lockheed uh, Missiles and uh, Space Company. So it was, a, it was a really kind of an easy transition. I didn't know much about space because I was an aeronautical engineer, and and in college there was no uh, there was no aerospace, so I had to we kind of had to figure out uh, what an orbit was and how you affected it and all that sort of thing. But that broke me, and I was trying to get to NASA the whole time, but it took me a little while before I got there. And I I finally arrived at, at NASA in 1964, uh, right before we started uh, to fly Gemini. And uh, so Gemini and Apollo, I was in mission control the whole time. Yeah, you were at uh, GNC, right? Right. Guidance and Gemini, uh, I was at GNC. Yeah. Uh, guidance and navigation and control systems. And, um, and then uh, after the, I was going to be a GNC for Apollo and was in the control center the night the Apollo 1 fire occurred. And, and after that, uh, Chris Kraft decided he wanted three more flight directors. So between the time of the fire and the time we flew the first manned mission, uh, he made me a, a name three of us actually as flight directors. And so I was a flight director for all of Apollo. Uh, so you were a lead director, lead flight director on Apollo 12, 15, and 17. Correct. And um, you were the lead lunar uh, uh, landing director on Apollo 13. I was, yes, I was to do the landing on Apollo 13. And of course, when that got scrubbed, I just, we all started cycling around and, and uh, making sure to get them home. By the way, I did do, get to do the landing on 14 and on 16 and 17. So I got three of the six. Uh, my team and I were the fortunate ones that got to do that. But, but yeah, I was uh, 13 was uh, kind of, we really got scrambled up after the oxygen tank uh, exploded. And uh, we knew pretty quickly we weren't going to land. And uh, so we redid the manning list. As a matter of fact, we took Gene Kranz's team kind of offline. And since they were on duty when that tank exploded, we figured they knew the most about how they powered the command module down and therefore would be in the best role to figure out how to power it back up. Um, that's kind of missed in Apollo 13. That, that is very interesting. The uh, Apollo, the command module and the lunar module were powered up at the launch pad in, in Florida. And they, um, we had, when they were down there, they had a lot of ground support. We called it ground support equipment, electrical input, uh, water, all kinds of, of what we call that ground support equipment. We refer to it as GSE. We had to have a, an abbreviation, but the GSE was really what got the, the 
vehicle started. Once it got up and running prior to launch, we never turned one off. And in the case of the command module, we turned it completely off. And so then it was a real test of the people on the ground to figure out how to power it back up again without blowing out every circuit breaker and, and all of that. That's what took so long. But Gene's team, uh, Gene Kranz's team, uh, was offline and, and got to do that. Now they did come back for the entry because they were best suited for the entry. And, uh, but it uh, turns out the other three teams we had, which was, was Glenn Lunny and Milt Wendler and, and me that made the third, we just rotated shifts um, until that re-entry point came back. Um, we'll go back to Apollo 13 uh, after that. Uh, after uh, all the, the flight director's duties you had, uh, you were uh, a technical advisor on the Apollo 13 movie, but also in contact and deep impact. More in the NASA business, you were deputy director at uh, Dryden uh, Research Center and uh, deputy director at NASA Kennedy Space Center, and finally, director of the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston. So that's, that's, right. that's a, a big step up. What, what are you doing now? Well, actually now, in many ways, I'm busier than I've ever been in my life. Um, I've always had a consulting business ever since I got out of NASA, and I've served on several boards and I still uh, boards of directors, and I, I still do that. Um, I've got two boards that I serve on now, and I still have my consulting business. But what I've really been busy with is celebrating 50th anniversaries of of all these Apollo missions. I've uh, it's it really got started with well, clear back to seven, which was the first man and uh, mission, and we. And of course, it hit a big crescendo uh, on Apollo 11, and I was all over the country. In fact, I was in in uh, France, France. Uh, when I saw you. I was in Australia uh, or earlier, actually, right before that, and um, and I ended up being all over the United States. Now, 12, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 12 was a little more subdued, but still. Uh, I, I had events all over the country. And then 13 has been almost like uh, Apollo 11. A lot of celebrations. Tragically, many of them had to get postponed because of the virus. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, most of them are being reset for the fall. And hopefully we can, can uh, get those in. Um, and it's interesting because 13, with its oxygen tank problem, there was a pretty good gap until 14 flew. I think it was February of next year would be our 50th. So we've got a little time in there to celebrate 13 if we can just get <laughs> scheduled and done in, in the fall. But I've been busy. It, it's busy. It's one. Of, it's. I, I'm as busy as I've ever been in my life. Yeah, you, and uh, the the hype people have with the celebration is a bit like uh, you you can compare it with the real re, uh, the real missions hype. You know, uh, Apollo eleven was big, then it was uh, going a bit uh, low, and then Apollo thirteen brought it back in the media's, and then it, uh, yeah, they, it that's right, it that's exactly again. right. The the cycle uh, was really big eleven, a dip in twelve, back at thirteen, and then back down to 14. Uh, those, the last three missions got a little more attention because of the rover, and it was a little different, and you see guys scooting around the surface uh, of the moon uh, in a car, essentially. And, lo and longer missions. And longer missions, and much more uh, science-oriented. So it really turned on the science community. Uh, by the time we got to those last three missions, we were pretty comfortable with the with the spacecraft and the, all of that and how it worked. And so even in the control center, we really started emphasizing getting the science that uh, we knew we could do, particularly with the rover where we could, the crew could get out far further away and uh, get things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
but never overconfidence. No, no. No, that's that's something you don't have to you no. you, you have to to move move out if you want to be a, a flight controller, right? That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, let's go back to Apollo 13. Um, when when the problem happened, um, how were you involved in this uh, in all the 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 circus uh, that organized as you as you as you explained it earlier? And what did you feel personally during this mission? Because I guess you knew the astronauts at, at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. The the astronauts, all of them, and, and all of Apollo were really good friends. We lived close together. Uh, many of our kids went to school together and played together. And and um, so, yeah, we were very uh, close people. I was, it was funny, on 13, I had just, I got off shift. I, my shift ended with my team um, and we handed over to Gene Kranz uh, and his team. And And that's when the tank exploded several hours later. I told him, I've joked with him over the years that when I left, everything was completely good. And uh, you managed to let it go to heck. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, but we, and we've laughed about that quite a bit. Actually, I was out playing a softball game at night. Uh, and, um, and they actually notified us that... Uh, There had been a problem, and that we had probably should get back to the control center. Uh, so we did. Uh, another fellow and I, another flight controller. And it was interesting when I walked in the control center. Um, there were more people there than normal, but it was calm. It was not not too wild. Um, and in fact, in the movie. Uh, with Ron Howard, there were always people moving around and all that, and I kept saying, "You need to, you know, calm that down." It, it, that's not the way it was. One thing I could tell is that he didn't like to have scenes with still <laughs> people standing still or sitting still. So, anyhow, um, I stuck around long enough to get the basic idea of what had something was going on. We had lost a bunch of oxygen and um, they had started to power up the lunar module to use it as a lifeboat. And about that time I decided I'd better get home and get some sleep because we reworked the schedule and I was to follow Glenn Lunny who came in and relieved uh, Gene Kranz's team um, about the time they started to get into the lunar module. So I went home and tried to sleep and I, I couldn't. And uh, by the time I got back, the schedule had been worked out how all the teams were going to cycle and the fact that we were uh, letting Gene figure out what they had done and what how best to power up the command module. The interesting thing about all of that, in fact, when Ron Howard listened to the to the voice tapes and all, he said, it didn't sound like there was much of a problem. And, uh, in fact, he I could tell he wasn't sure he was going to make that movie because he wasn't sure there was enough emotion in it. And I told him, I said, no, there was plenty of emotion. We just, we didn't have time to express it. And uh, we never talked about not getting them back. We said, okay, here we go. Let's, let's uh, knock this thing out and see if we can Um, uh, get them back okay. So we never talked. We never talked about not getting them home. And and we we had been the reason we could do that is it's the way we were trained. Um, we did hours and hours of simulation and uh, before a mission. And the simulation people that could throw in problems and all that. They really exercised us hard. We, they could bring us to our knees eventually if they gave us enough failures. We couldn't deal with them all. But what, what all that training did, we hadn't seen exactly that kind of simulation, but we were ready for it because 
it was, it, it, we just normally got into a cadence and a rhythm of let's get this thing solved and get it done. That came from the training. So mm -hmm. I have to I always think it's important to recognize it. And I, I tell the people for the future, the Artemis and more that are going to go beyond that. Um, the training was the key to our success in, in leaving Earth and going somewhere else. And I think it's going to be just as true in, in 2030 or 2050 or whenever as it was mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1960s and 70s. So 13 uh, came out successfully, I think, because of the training we had and the crew. The astronauts were trained much the same way, exhaustive simulation. And I'll, I'll make one final point on that. In many ways, except for Apollo 13, all the flights were easier than the simulations. The simulations were tougher because we, we usually ended up uh, learning something that we hadn't. Uh, and many times we had to abort or we crashed or something because the sim guys really laid it on us. And, and uh, it's a bit, little bit like a marathon runner practicing on the beach and then running on a hard surface. Uh, it, it was easier to do the real thing than it was uh, the training, but it prepared us. And that's what, that was the secret of Apollo 13. We can say that you were very, very professional and not showing emotions during the mission, but once it landed in the ocean, uh, you could uh, release everything. Right. That's true. When after the landing uh, was successful, we got them back. We didn't celebrate till they got onto the carrier uh, deck of the carrier because we always felt like the, uh, you know they might drown or something if if uh, the helicopter didn't work right or crashed or something. So when they stepped out on the carrier, uh, it was a an emotional relief, it, a joy. And, uh, celebration and uh, we had one heck of a party uh, uh, that that evening uh, and we were all tired we were exhausted because we had slept much but we were all young too we were in our mid-30s and several guys in the control center were in their 20s and uh, so we were young and kind of resilient but the next day is when president nixon came and presented the Medal of Freedom to the whole teams. And uh, I look at that picture and I can see fatigue. <laughs> we were all tired. And uh, anyway, not only from the mission, but from the night before. And, uh, but we got through it all and it, and it was just fine. But yeah, it was uh, uh, happiness is, and satisfaction. And there was satisfaction. Yeah, we can cl clearly see it uh, on the famous photo of uh, uh, Jim Krenz and yours yeah. in the mission control with the cigars. On your face, we can decipher uh, something like, uh, we completed it, we made it. Yep. it, it, it it's yeah. as joy and we made it. Yep. Accomplishment, you know. You're, you're exactly right. And, you know, late in the entry um, uh, into the Earth's atmosphere, we had blackout. And it, that was normal it, due to the heat, the sheath, the sheath of fire coming around it. And then we didn't come out of blackout on time. And that was an interesting time because we had, nobody said a word. Everybody was looking forward, uh, didn't look at each other. Uh, but I know we were all thinking, oh gosh, they, Maybe that explosion damaged the heat shield and they didn't make it into the atmosphere. They burned up. And um, when we, and I'll, I'll never forget, Joe Kerwin, uh, astronaut, was at Capcom and he kept calling Apollo 13, this is Houston, Apollo 13. He, about every 15, 30 seconds, he would get no answer. Finally, one of the times he called, he said, Apollo 13, this is Houston, and Swagger come back. Oh, hello, Houston. How you doing? We're doing fine. And we all went, oh, we almost fell out. <laughs> and uh, that was the moment where I think we were probably the happiest in the whole history. And when we 
about that same time, we saw the parachutes with the command module on the bottom of it. And uh, so we knew that we had a good chance of finishing up the mission then. And, and that was a great relief. And then when they stepped on the carrier deck, it was light the cigars and pat each other on the back. We must have, I bet we stayed in that control center for 30 minutes, shaking each other's hands and, and that kind of thing. It was, it was neat. So uh, after uh, Apollo 13, uh, did it change something in your way to apprehend the next mission, Apollo 14? Uh, did you have more fears, more? No. Did it change something? Uh, we didn't. We didn't change. Uh, obviously, we made some changes in the spacecraft to uh, make sure that that kind of thing didn't happen again, and change the tank. Inner, inner design and all that. Um, and 13 uh, was kind of an eye opener in some ways because we had been very successful uh, up through 11 after we started on seven and up through 11. We'd, we'd had some problems, but nothing that was a showstopper. So 13 was kind of a wake up call to, uh oh, just a good reminder, which we all knew, this is not an easy task. Um, this is hard business and it, it can bite you very easily uh, when you're not expecting it. We certainly weren't expecting it on, on uh, 13. Um, so I think we, it probably did sharpen us up a little bit and, and put us in good shape to go 14, 15, 16, and 17 to finish the program. Uh, but in terms of changing the way we did business in the control center, uh, we didn't. Uh, we thought we were organized okay. Uh, we started the program with six flight directors, and you know, and that's the way we ended it. We started with seven, and ended with uh, Apollo seven, and we ended with seventeen, with six of us uh, still circulating around and and uh, getting some. Uh, some relief and and we if you'll notice in the later apollo missions those and in fact it was true in in uh, 13 we actually had gone to 14 we started the program with only three but we found out it was a little easier to schedule um, having the right team on at the right time at the point in the mission to do the landing or the ascent from the moon or whatever uh, it was easier to do that teams rather than three. Um, so it spread the workload a little bit and it it worked well. 13, uh, I'm glad we had the four teams because it, it did allow us to get Kranz off and let him uh, work on the solution of getting that command module powered back up. And uh, so uh, it was, it, it 13 was, uh, Good exercise. I'm glad. In fact, you know, Jim Lovell, I've heard him say uh, about that blackout period where uh, we went into blackout right on time. And usually within a second, we could predict when we come out. And it just went on and on and on. And he said, uh, actually, he was joking, of course. He said, actually, we could hear you all the time, but I thought it might make a good movie. And uh, and then he laughs real big. So, so uh, there was some humor that came out of it, and uh, not too much while we were in the middle of it. But uh, when it when it was all over, uh, we've enjoyed talking about it. Yeah, uh, and on the personal aspect, did it change something in your way to see life, maybe, uh, or to experience things other than professionally? Uh, I didn't uh, have any personal changes. Uh, I had been, as I mentioned earlier, I'd been in the Air Force. I had um, flown and seen air, aircraft. A guy, you know, I'd have breakfast with him in the morning and he'd be dead in the afternoon due to a crash. Um, and when you're in your early 20s, uh, after a while, you kind of you build up a little bit of a scar tissue and try not to let it affect you too much. It always affects you, but, um, 
and the same thing with with missions that like 13 that were you didn't accomplish everything that you set out to do that was so in that way it was a failure but it was a very successful failure and uh so we were pleased at the outcome and there were no um big attitude changes on my part now some i don't think any i don't know of anybody that did but there could have been um uh, um that was back in the days of macho you know you uh, you didn't show emotion uh, as easily as maybe you do now but we were we were uh we stayed professionally attuned pretty much the way I think all of us did. I know I did uh, until we got to the very end. And, uh, and then I kind of thought, what next? Well, it was shuttle. And uh, actually it was ASTP and, and uh, Skylab, but, but uh, that was Apollo hardware. And I was already gone by that time. I, was, I had gone to Washington to headquarters. And, uh, but then I got back into the operational business when I went when I went as deputy director at Dryden, it's when we did the uh, approach and landing test with with uh, the shuttle. And then I went to the Cape, and I was there until we launched the first shuttle. And then I came back to Houston. So after that, I got back to the fun stuff. At Washington was uh, uh, like going to, like going like going to Paris. I mean, <laughs> it. Uh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, too much government, too much uh, red tape. Things happen slowly, and I actually I told my super bosses there. I told them I I had to get back to the real world. Please send me anywhere, and uh, they did. They were they were kind to me. Uh, yeah, the, 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 I see you. You know friends uh, very well. It's a bit like uh, like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I was asking that because when the problem on the Apollo 13 occurred, uh, you could see a lot of people, uh, I mean the, the regular people, uh, saying in the media, what is the purpose of space? Where do we oh, yeah. take so much uh, danger? We already lost someone on, uh, three people on Apollo 1. Uh, we, we keep uh, sending people. Why we go to the moon? We got to the moon once we beat the russian we got the we got to the moon twice for apollo 12 why why do we keep keep doing that and yeah. and yeah maybe uh, i was i was uh, maybe imagining people in houston thinking the same thing i mean why am i working for that kind of space program that can kill someone i know you know well that's good it's a good question the you know anything that is that's got a risk, um, you've got to figure out if the risk is worth taking. It's just like getting on an airliner and flying from Paris to Houston, uh, and you finally decide yes, that's worth the risk for the gain that you get out of it. And I think space is pretty much the same way. Uh, is the risk worth the gain? One thing I think it's really important to remember is that Apollo going to the moon even six times was a little teeny, teeny baby step of what I think human species is gonna have to do eventually. And that's to go much deeper to other places. And for a reason, not only scientific curiosity and knowledge, but uh, one day, and it's not, I'm not talking global warming or anything like that, that could be a piece of it, but um, this, we may use this planet up. And if the human species, a thousand years from now, 10,000 years, I don't know when, uh, wants to survive, then we're likely gonna have to find someplace else to take the species. So this little baby step, that we took to get to the moon, I think just proves the concept that we can do it. It can be done. And with better technology, newer technology, long range things that we don't even know about now, we can't even imagine. Um, 
we could stand on the shoulders of Apollo and take those start to take those next steps, and and Apollo will look like, you know, a, a flight of of uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright or somebody and early Frenchman that flew some funny looking airplanes. Uh, that's what Apollo will look like one day, not yet, but one day that it'll it'll be so primitive that. Uh, Said, so how'd they do it? And in fact, I get that question now. And I don't know. I'm not, you know, that was 50 years ago. It's hard to imagine that it was 50 years ago. And we did it with technology that, that pretty simple. It, I mean, it was compared to today. I mean, there was nothing like you and I it's sitting here talking across the ocean, uh, Atlantic Ocean, it, it, like it was a telephone call. And but we see each other as well. So I really do think that 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 it was worth the gain. Um, even after the fire, we had the same kind of people that, that said, why is it all worth it? And, you know, you, three astronauts were killed on the pad and you hadn't even launched. I mean, because, and, um, and so we did have, we did have those naysayers that, but I said the same thing then that, Hey, we're trying to learn here, and anytime you're learning, you're going to have, particularly with humans involved in it, you're going to have missteps and mistakes, and um, it's just like airplanes. I think commercial airplanes, if you fly them long enough, one of them's going to crash. I mean, it's just you got the human element in it, and it's it is risky. It's not as easy as walking, uh, and so. I, I think there's a reason for it, and I never felt, I heard some of those comments when I was around, but I, they kind of bounced off of me. I, I didn't even think they were, there. it was such a small minority, vocal, very loud, but small. And most, most of the people are saying, go for it, you know, get it, do it, and uh, we're very proud people all over the world, not just Americans, were very proud when we, when we went to the moon and did it successfully. And, and, and we felt like, you know, the whole world was with us for the most part. <laughs> Russians might not have been, the Soviets may not have been quite so, but even they, I think they, uh, they came around to the point that it was, hey, well done. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons they follow uh, astronauts particularly are very close to the, the Russian cosmonauts of that era. Um, we didn't get to know them very well in Mission Control. A few I've met. And, and, but the astronauts are very, very close to each other, the cosmonauts. And uh, it did feel like a kind of a world accomplishment. It did to me. And I was glad we could do it. Yeah, and te technically it was a world accomplishment because when you think about, for example, uh, the reflectors uh, on the moon yep. that were made in France or yep. uh, the yep. landing legs that were yep. made in Montreal, yep. uh, yep. It, it was it was a world contribution. Even uh, scientifically, with all the findings we had from the from the samples, right. uh, it was in the, in the international. So yeah, we planted a U.S. flag, but. We planted this flag with uh, the knowledge and the brains from all over the world. Yep. Except yep. the Russian. And, and uh, yeah, I've always, the flag was because we had the ship. <laughs> but but uh, our, it would have been like, well, like a ship landing on a new coast and saying, okay, nobody owns this, so we're going to put our flag on. But, but I felt like it was, it, it really, you know, Neil said it. Uh, it was for all mankind and and, uh, and uh, humankind, I guess we would say today to be politically correct. But but uh, it, it was a great accomplishment for I think for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, even uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going a bit maybe a bit far away. But uh, when you think about uh, Yuri Kondratayuk, uh, maybe you you know him. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Yuri Kondratayuk. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he made the Apollo way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. 
so, 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 so even in the Soviet Union, you have something that was a legacy that led that led to Apollo. So yeah, yeah it was really the work of of everyone, everyone back right. to Newton, back to Galileo, back to everyone. It it's a yeah. continuous um, and step further uh, from from all the places. You have contribution yeah. from, from and all then the places. Hubble uh, Space Telescope has taught us so much more about what's even further out and and the people that will follow us in generations uh, will go there. I'm convinced they will go there. They'll go to some of those really, really far away places. Uh, we, we hope so. We both hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, you were talking about uh, learning from Apollo 13, learning from all the failures and missteps. Um, do you think the problems that occurred on Apollo 13 uh, can teach future flight controllers, future flight directors, and even rocket manufacturers on what to do and what not to do, specifically Apollo 13? I th yeah, I think 13 taught us a lot. Every mission had problems. Some were, some of those problems were nagging, and then some were pretty serious. But every mission, we learned something that helped us in the next mission and the next mission and the next mission. And uh, I think that that knowledge base, it, you know, I really thought at the end of Apollo, I thought we would be on Mars in 20 years. Of course, I was kind of young and naive, and uh, I just thought that would happen, but it didn't. And now we've had this. 50-year break of deep space travel, but we've had a continuum pretty much of, of at least space travel, getting into space and getting out of space. And particularly the launch from Earth is probably, I think, is the hardest thing we do. And entry, yeah, entry, you got to go through a lot of heat there, take all that heat out that you put in going up and but the the heat or the uh, the fact that that you've got all of this energy stored in this rocket it's not too big it just mm -hmm. to hold it all, all together while you launch and get going uh, is very very dangerous so at least that's the, we've we've never stopped doing that We've, we've had something that was being launched. Now the commercial sector is coming in and they're launching. And they're going to step their toes some, but they're doing well so far. They're okay. Yeah. SpaceX had that one satellite failure, but, but they're, they're doing okay. Um, but every time we, we do this, uh, we're adding to our knowledge base of what it's going to take to safely travel in space. And we've been able to do that for the last 50 years. We just haven't gone past Earth orbit, which I thought we would have with humans some time ago. But now we've got a chance. Uh, the young people that, that watch this are going to be the ones that are going to have the opportunity to go back to the moon, some of them, and on to Mars. And, and Mars is even not the last place. I think we're going to. I think what we're going to do is keep looking for an Earth-like place so that we could uh, literally colonize it and, and, and make the species live forever, or at least another 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 years. And uh, I think it's just survival. It'll be that drive that will make it necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, even um, during the time when astronauts were not in deep space but orbiting the Earth, uh, we sent so much probes in our solar system that discovered so so many worlds where possible life can be, like and not necessarily on another star, but also in in our solar system, like Europa, like Enceladus, like yep. Titan. Uh, these words are very uh, potentially 
having life in it. So yeah, it's it's. Uh, and I, it's, you're making a very good point because the, uh, I think, the exploration of deep space is going to be a combination. Should be a combination of robotics, and then followed by hu uh, humans. Your robotics spacecraft or your scouts, they're the ones that go find out what's there and is it promising and and uh, could we do something with that, either mining it or, or living on it, whatever. And, uh, and uh, so I think that combination of robotics and humans are, are necessary. In the old days, we we didn't think that way. Not in the even in the Apollo years, we had to. We felt like we had to go first with people, although we did have surveyors and and uh, other kinds of robotic ranger that went to uh, to the moon. And the Soviets had their Lunokhod and stuff like that. But we didn't think of it in terms that that was a precursor. We just thought it well. That's kind of okay, but you really got to get humans there. Well. I, I know in the last 50 years, I've come to the point realizing that robotics coupled with humans is the way we're going to get this done. If we, we're going to go into really deep space and, uh, and, and stay there. I understand. And uh, I, I'm t I totally agree with you. <laughs> um, it's not one go... versus the other, it's both. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, a, co yeah, it's, yeah, it's a combination. combination. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the movie section. Uh, let's talk about movies. Uh, so you were a technical advisor on Apollo 13, so you may be biased, but how accurate do you think Apollo 13 movie is uh, versus the reality of what happened? The, uh, the Apollo 13 movie is actually very accurate technically. Now, when I, I remember the first day on the set, after uh, I had met Ron Howard before, but the first day on the set, he said it then, and he said probably said it a half a dozen times later. Uh, I'm not doing a documentary. I'm, I'm putting together an entertaining movie that I want to be factually correct, but I've got to have license to maybe make things happen a little differently but it wasn't the what happened, it's how it happened. Let me give you a good example. The movie opens with a scene where everybody's gathering up and they're, I think they're going to Armstrong's house or maybe Jim Lovell's house, but they're going to somebody's house to watch Apollo 11 land. And uh, so they got all these astronauts, and all these people, and it, that didn't happen. But what Ron said was, it's a way I can introduce a bunch of characters at once. And it had nothing to do with the technical side of Apollo 13, but it was a way he could he could uh, get, uh, get a lot of characters introduced in the movie. He said, I, if I don't do things like this, he was kind of teaching, I think, a little bit. He, but he said, if I don't do th things like this, this movie will be four hours long. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like for it to be around two hours. I think it came out 220, two hours and 20 minutes. But, but he was, he, as the movie went on, as the first movie I'd worked on, I could see what he was saying. He was, and he told, he, he told me, he said, if you see anything technically wrong, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll fix it. And he did, he did. He, but and he made it a little more emotional. For instance, like when Jack Swigert was replaced on the crew, um, or he he did the replacement of Ken Mattingly, uh, they played it up that that Lovell and Hayes were a little bit standoffish. They didn't like him or didn't think he was, and that was not that never happened. Uh, Jack was extremely well prepared, and they they were. They felt bad for Ken Mattingly uh, getting bumped off the crew, but but it didn't have anything to do with technically. It was making the thing more emotional and entertaining. And I can tell you, although Gene Kranz um, 
well, it was a pretty serious guy. Uh, he wasn't anywhere near as serious as, as Ed Harris <laughs> turned out to be. I worked a lot with Ed on, on, the, uh, on his part because he was a flight director. And of course, that fit my, my bill. And uh, so I, I worked uh, with him closely. He's a great actor. But, but he, he was portrayed in a little more as being abrupt. And, and, and Gene has a little of that quality to him, but, but nothing like... Uh, uh, Less military, maybe? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> but Gene, Gene is... Uh, uh, Gene, Gene's pretty serious. And he's, and, but Ed did a, a good job, and he did exactly the way I think Ron wanted him to come across. But again, it didn't have anything to do with the technical aspect. I'll give you one more example. When you'll remember on 13, we had to figure out a way to get the carbon dioxide out. And we had a number of square containers in the command module, which was turned off, uh, but they wouldn't fit in the square, module though. round hole. So you had a square peg trying to go into a round hole. Um, and you probably know the story. I know you do, but your listeners probably do too. Um, is that figured out a way to do that with you know, tape and paper and plastic and all kinds of things. Well, that was done by a group of guys uh, at Johnson. Run uh, that group was run by a guy named Ed Smiley, and he did collect everybody together and say, "Okay, what have we got on board?" We've got these things, and how can we make this happen? And they figured out what was on board. And what they did. Well, in the movie, if you recall, the guy walks in and he's got this bucket of stuff and he throws it on this table and says, Okay, that's what we got. Uh, now we got to figure out how to make this thing work. And of course, that didn't happen that way. But again, technically, it didn't. It was just the way he set it up, it mm. didn't have anything to do with what the technical outcome. Yeah. So there were places in the movie like that 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 uh, I finally got my engineering brain uh, to accept. And um, but I got some. I did have some comments after the movie. That, Why'd you let him do it that way? Or why'd you? And I said, Hey, I wasn't the director. I was an advisor. And uh, but it was a great experience. It was it was fascinating. And one of the things I learned about the movie business. And I saw it later in, in contact and deep impact. He says those people work very, very hard to get it right. <clears throat> and they they reminded me in many ways of the space program. They were goal oriented. They would work any hours to get it done. They dedicated to the task. I mean, once they started, it was it was as hard a working team as all of them as I've seen. And and at the end, a lot of satisfaction. So it had it. It was a little bit like the space business that I had experienced, where you had this dedicated team of people. Let's get it done and uh, work hard. Speaking of a uh, technical uh, advisor, uh, you had some luck because uh, I guess some di uh, directors of movies. Uh, don't listen to the technical advisor they uh, they uh, hire. Like for example, I guess it would be uh, it would have been a mess to work on Armageddon. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, amen. And um, yeah, it. I. When you got into real fiction, which we did with Contact, but of course it was based on a book written by Carl Sagan who was a renowned astronomer, that there was technical realism in it. And uh, so that was, that was good. Uh, Deep Impact was total fiction about going, splitting a comet. And that one, you know, I, about all I could do is help them with what it looked like, you know, and I, For instance, in Deep Impact, I went back to uh, to uh, Robert Duvall's farm in Virginia and spent a couple of days with him going through the script before um, 
we actually started shooting. Did the same thing with Jody Foster in contact. Um, and those kinds of actors and actresses work hard at even their hand motion. They, they want to get it right. I remember Duvall wanted to know, do you hold, it, it had kind of a shuttle type of controller in this fictional spaceship. And uh, he wanted to know, do you hold it tight or do you, you know, kind of grip it or do you kind of light touch? And I gave him the light touch because sometimes you had to grab it to, because for other functions. But, but my point is, is that these guys really prepare. And I started with, you know, my movie career was people like Tom Hanks and Ron Howard and, and uh, Bob Semikas is the director on Contact and Jody Foster and then uh, young director Mimi Leader, but Robert Duvall on uh, Deep Impact. And so I kind of started at the top. <laughs> Instead of most of that business starts from the bottom, you have to work your way up. And uh, this, I kind of started at the top. And, uh, and I was fortunate and I learned a lot about it. Um, and develop my creative side of my brain a little bit better than it was. It, it's still, you know, when you're an engineer and used to exactness and all that, it it takes a little uh, training, <laughs> at least, or sometimes kind of looking the other way to say, okay, all right, let's go. And but it's fun. it was fun. Yeah, and and your answer leads me to uh, my next question because uh, now when you see movies, you must have Uh, space movies you must have an eye on things and uh, what do you think about the Martian in terms of problem solving team work etc uh, what do you think about this uh, this movie well I, th I think they're all uh, thought-provoking and, and thought-provoking in a good way I mean it makes you think about what, what would you do in that situation you can either totally panic and do something wild or you can kind of start figuring it out, see if you can use the, the central computer and, uh, and try to figure it out. I, I, I really think the, uh, the whole idea of, of movies in general, uh, it changed it for me to watch a movie. You mentioned space movies, but, and that's where I'm probably more critical and, thinking, but all movies to me, after I've worked on, on them now, uh, I'm more interested in the, how did they do that, you know, kind of idea of how did he get that impression or what, what's that lighting there? I was always interested in lighting and, and uh, how they, and sound, and some of the sound guys. Um, and it was funny, I remember my first film, Apollo 13, When we had a break or a lighting change or whatever, I would immediately either find Tom Hanks or Ron or somebody, and I wanted to know how they were doing this and what they were thinking. And they wanted to talk about the real mission. So it was funny, we would kind of start this conversation with me, me talking about the real mission and them talking about something that, uh, uh, them talking about the real mission and I was talking about, well, Why'd you, why'd you like that that way? I, so today, every film I watch, I have to, it's hard to enjoy it as much because I want, even the new stuff, I want to look at how they did it. And, and uh, so it's kind of an interesting fallout. I really think that the move, the space movies that have been made lately are good. They're, they're, uh, and they've got, technology and capabilities that weren't around in 1994 when we were filming Apollo 13. Oh, Apollo 13 is still very legit uh, in terms of uh, special effects. If you, if you, When you know that in the capsule they were in zero G, uh, yeah. it, it's so difficult to reproduce uh, that kind of, of motion yeah. that it's still, it's still very legit when you watch it. It, it don't It's, it's not like uh, very old uh, movies from the 60s, like maybe uh, 2001. 
yeah. uh, which in terms of special effects really got old a bit. But um, but yeah, um, I think Apollo 13 is still legit because it was so much involved in making the thing the most realis- 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 realistically uh, accurate as possible that you you can uh, think you, you could you could you know um, turn it into a, an old VHS and right. then uh, compare with the real footage from Apollo yeah. 13 and yeah. you will get the same very same thing because yeah. it was so accurate you know those pictures on 13 when when the crew was in the spacecraft and it was so cold and their breath was that really happened they they put that thing inside a It was so cold inside that set. The cameraman had on Alaskan type hoods and gloves, you know, it was cold. And uh, those guys who Bacon and, and uh, Kevin Bacon and, and, uh, and those guys would get out and they would be shivering. They'd be really, really cold. And so that's another realistic Thing that they were able to do that that I thought was amazing. I said, Gee, so they took that whole sound stage and sealed it up and took it down and made it go. Well, anyway, that was I. I think the movie uh, p- uh, depictions that we see now uh, are more and more realistic all the time, and and that's going to make it particularly good for the young kids that. Uh, They know, they, you know, they're smart. They and they can tell a fake when they see it. But uh, computer graph between the computer graphics and the uh, and the other technologies that they've got now, they can really make things look real. And I'm sure you do some of that in your own business. Uh, a little. No, no. Uh, I, I have some trouble with that. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, yeah. Um, The, the the thing is yeah when when they um, they shot the Martian they went to Jordania to have a big landscape uh, and the scene where the crew uh, escapes from Mars in the beginning yeah uh, you 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 see they are shaking because they they made the the the, yeah. the rocket shake for real and uh, the thing I like with the Martian and Apollo 13 uh, which is different from all the others the other space movies is that You don't have uh, like depressive astronauts right. when they are in faced with uh, danger. Danger. They're... When yeah. when you see First Man, for example, when yeah. where you see Neil Armstrong very very dark in the face, yeah. or uh, or even Interstellar, uh, yeah. you you have you have sad astronauts. You you have people that are passive to what's happen happens. They are yeah. they are not active. They are not. Um, saying, okay, this is a problem, I'm going to solve it. Right. And that's, I, I think that's too bad. because well, you're, you're right on, right on. It, yeah, because th- that's too bad, because that's the point of being an astronaut, a flight director, etc. It's problem solving every yeah, day. It's the challenge. Yeah, it's the, that's what makes you, that's what makes you enjoy it. Yeah, it, it, It's not what everybody does. I mean, this is different. <laughs> so, yeah. No, you're right. You're right on. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, long live uh, Apollo 13 and the Martian. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my favorite ones. Um, last questions. Um, in these difficult times, we, we talk about problem solving. Uh, what kind of advice uh, a flight director, as you were, could give to the people about uh, about experiencing a lockdown as we do now? Because we all, with all the, the The, the psych- psychological problems it can have for people yeah. to be locked down at home, uh, far away from uh, from someone we love, uh, with all the um, the worries regarding the, vi- the virus. What can you tell them? What would you tell them? And I can only speak for myself. I think I think the training I had in in Apollo helps. Uh, my own philosophy is is that this can be beaten, but you have to you have to follow some careful steps, just like we did in the space business. 
and you have to play by the rules. Um, you can't you can't ignore the fact that you're facing a threat, just like we did in thirteen. We knew it was a threat, but let's not get all. And and yeah, we had to do things differently. We didn't sleep for three and a half days on the ground. Those guys slept hardly at all in, in space. Um, it was hard on them, and there was always that danger that they uh, might not make it, although we never talked about it and never discussed it. But I, I really think in this time right now, we're being tested as a species, if you will, to a threat that is uh, it's probably not going to uh, result in as many deaths as the 1918 flu epidemic uh, worldwide, but it's not going to be a small impact. And when it's over, rather than, I, I know in this country at least, we're, we'll probably get, spend the next two years talking about what we did wrong. What I'd like to do is spend the next two years, what did we learn? And what did we learn that worked? And what did we learn that didn't work? So the next mission or next pandemic, we can apply what we learn to that one. The fact that we made a mistake and all was not as important to us as getting it right the next time and don't let that mistake happen again. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we, we can learn a lot from this about ways to face the next pandemic. One of the things is we've never had a pandemic where we had such great communication uh, around the world, the internet, um, television, all of that has given us this instant uh, idea or position by one guy or the next guy or the next gal or whatever. Um, and we've got to learn to live with that too, because a lot of it is bogus. It is not very good. Some of it's excellent. But uh, I wish there was a way we could put a filter <laughs> in somewhere that says, okay, listen to this one because it's really, really good. Now, we do that amongst ourselves. I, you know, you say, hey, I've gotten a number of things. I said, you got to watch this one. It's a great, I saw one the other day. It was a cartoon uh, type of video, but it's serious in the way the virus works and the way it moves around and is excellent. It was really easy to understand the way it mutates and does this and that and so forth, and, um, or the way they think it does. And so I really think, I think uh, we're being tested right now to see if we can stand up. Uh, you know, I think, I think back, even on this one, I think back to France and World War II and what the people there went through with the Nazis and and the and particularly the Jewish uh, community and all that is horrible and uh, unthinkable and yet it happened but we learned from it that and we didn't that I don't think will ever happen again um, and and so that's what we've got to learn about handling pan, these pandemics and. Some periods of isolation are going to be necessary, and we need to learn how to do that. I think most of us are. It's kind of an on-the-job training. You never tried it before, but you gotta. You can't. Uh, you can't just start going off and trying to do things like you used to. And uh, but I think we'll. Uh, I think we'll come out of this okay. And I. I think the. Uh, that we got to have a positive thought. I don't think you need to. We don't need to rush it. Uh, we need to figure it out. And, and we've got people here, I don't know about in France, but we've got people here that want to open up everything, you know, because, well, we haven't had many cases in our town or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, you're just asking for it, I think, at this point. Now, maybe there'll be a way to do that carefully and get it back on everything back online. And, uh, <clears throat> but I think my space experience help, helps me in that. It, it, I mean, it's just, in, I hadn't thought about that, but it's just ingrained in my, we got a problem, let's attack it and see if we can fix it. 
and uh, come out the other side smarter. I, I agree with you and uh, and I hope uh, everything will go well uh, for you also and your family. Uh, and that's you. The best. That's the best I wish you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and um, I hope everyone will learn from every struggle we had in the past. And yeah, as you said, we are lucky today to have all these technologies to also uh, help us, keeping us... Um, busy during that time is because mm -hmm. you have to have your brain busy and also to speak with the family uh, if yeah. you're far from from far from them so yeah I, I think we are really lucky uh, to have all these technologies right now uh, yeah. to to help the us other, the other the other interesting thing uh, best and i think out of all this is what is the new normal going to be uh, it, I think things will, I think we're all really conscious of, uh, of washing our hands, for instance, and, and, uh, being careful when you cough or all of that. Um, and then uh, I think the question is, how long will it be to you hug somebody that you haven't seen in a long time? Uh, that's going to be interesting. Are you going to bump elbows or hit fist or exactly what are you going to do? And uh, so all of that's going to, the new normal may be a little different. And yeah, we'll be, that, that and would be, okay. yeah, that would be interesting to, yeah. to, to see. And uh, yeah. yeah, the best, the, as you said, the best thing is to learn from this and uh, and make it and never go forward. Happen again. Don't, don't. And go forward. Yeah. 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 Always go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Also in space. Yep. Also in space. Go Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks you so a lot. It and, was a great uh, pleasure. So I hope you liked this video. Uh, if you liked it, please leave a like, a comment, or even subscribe if you want to watch more content. I have some content in English, like the interview I made of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, this video is available with English subtitles. And of course, when Neil deGrasse Tyson is talking, He's talking in English. I could not end this video without saying thanks to Luca and all the team from Swiss Apollo. Uh, Swiss Apollo is an organization uh, preserving the, the memoir of uh, the Apollo program. So uh, they are doing a lot of conferences, a lot of meetings with Apollo astronauts, flight directors, and a lot of people that worked on the Apollo program. And uh, Luca from Swiss Apollo, Uh, released a book last year called uh, Apollo Confidential and this is a book you have to read. Simply excellent. It's wonderful because you have a lot of testimonies from all the people that work on the program and um, mainly it's exclusive stories and very personal stories and you will understand more what it was all about. So uh, you have the link in the description if you want to read it. And of course, stay home, take care of yourself. We live difficult times, I know, and uh, I hope you all get well. See ya.